you know, I just started a new Baldur's Gate 3 playthrough, been having a lot of fun with it, and been downloading a lot of mods. So, you know, I figured I'd show some of my <clears throat> favorites. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 mod showcase and today we're going to be showing you a mod that removes all the black people from the game. Dude, what the hell is this? <sighs> you told me to find mods. Yeah, I was looking for fun mods, not mods that turn Will into some generic Tumblr sexy man protector. How dare you! I am not a woke Tumblr user. I'm not a furry. I'm not- Okay, okay, okay. I did not say any of that. Why? Look, this game is good, but it has problems following the tenets of proper traditional medieval accuracy as outlined in this foundational document of the Forgotten Realms. This document looks like a low res flyer from the 90s. Okay, maybe there are some flaws with it, I have to admit. Okay, I'm glad we can at least Like, make they couldn't even get rid of the blackness in his voice. You know? Like, there are plenty of voice actors who can hide their blackness. Like, Kratos in God of War, that voice actor, I didn't even know he was black. Alright, I didn't know. And he hit it really well. He's definitely one of the good ones. Does all of this stuff that you're saying not sound even like a tad How could you say I'm a racist? All right, I am doing what I want with this game that I own. I can do whatever I want with it. Dude, yeah, you can do whatever you want with this game. You can. But if you post about it online for other people to see, other people have the equal right to judge you for it. That's kind of how the world works. I have to live in a world where everyone doesn't unquestionably agree with every single thing I do all the time? <gasps> yeah, imagine that. I mean, how do you even survive playing this game? It's like one of the gayest things I've ever experienced. Oh, well, I made a mod that remodeled all the female characters in lesbian relationships and male characters in gay relationships and used AI to replace all their voices with proper, straight voice actors. Of course you did. Except for Shadowheart, of course. Cause you know, I want to jerk off to- Yeah, I know. You know, for a group of people who always brag about not having feelings and only paying attention to facts, their feelings got really uppity when the general community did not approve of these mods. Man, it's almost like- Homophobes and racists are a bunch of insecure little bitch. This is my first post, but my brother-in-law suggested I share the story here after I told him about it. It's pretty short and ultimately has a resolution, but there's still horror in the middle bit. I'm part of a few different games, but the one where this particular story takes place is one where I'm the youngest. Early 20s, while the other players are in like their mid-20s, 30s. I'm also the only female player character. The woman was too stunned to speak. I'm a recent addition to the group along with the one other player. Despite having a group of about five players, there's only really two individuals that need to be specified aside from myself. Rogue, the source of the horror, and Barbarian, the other recent addition to the group, who is honestly pretty cool. For some context, both Barbarian and myself were part of another group where Rogue was the DM. We were invited to join this group after the end of the campaign, and the group disbanded due to scheduling issues. Anyways, in that group, Rogue had a habit of not shutting up about how attractive the elves are in his world. Like, whenever we met elves, it was kind of weird, but it didn't happen too often, so I only really realized in hindsight. In this campaign, I played a sea elf warlock, which unfortunately would be rather relevant. This incident occurred during the third session Barbarian I ever played with this particular group. Our party was in the midst of planning out how to attack a bandit camp that had taken a merchant we were guarding captive. We spent a good amount of time strategizing and coming up with a solid plan against their fortifications. We had settled on our plan and were about to put it into action when out of nowhere Rogue turns to me. Wait, as an elf, how attractive would you say you are? Scale of 1 to 10. It's a very important question. 
I stared at him for a second before somehow growing a spine and asking him what his whole deal with elves was. I brought up how he always went on and on about how hot elves were in his campaign. He shrugged and said, because elves in my world are hot. Anyways, the reason I ask is because what if we had you go to the entrance of the bandit camp and pretend to be some maiden and charm them? That would work, right? Hey, generic bandit number two, look over there. Oh my god. Is that some random elf lady trying to seduce us? By winking? Why do people always try this? Like, doesn't she know that we're dangerous criminal bandits? And that we're, we're gay? Yeah, for each other. Yeah, lady really did not think this through. People need to stop making those assumptions. Gay people can be evil too. It's an inclusive space. <sighs> You're right, honey. Target down. <sighs> the way you killed that innocent woman was so freaking hot. Thanks. Do you want to passionately make out now? Sure. I was, quite frankly, shocked. Thankfully, I was saved from having to come up with an immediate response because all the other players immediately turned him down and said, hey, that's a terrible idea. They spent the next few moments chastising him for even suggesting that. Barbarian even said this isn't Looney Tunes and told him how dangerous it would be to send a party member into the bandit camp by themselves. When the scolding died down, I turned to Rogue and said, I'm not gonna damsel and distress my way through any encounters. That's not the kind of game I'm here to play and that's not the kind of character I've made. As the DM was having us roll for initiative in preparation for the combat, I heard Barbarian say to Rogue, would you be willing to do that? And Rogue said something along the lines of, well, yeah, if I, if I like had to. My guess is that he said that because he was just getting defensive. Anyways, if the rest of the group hadn't come to my defense, I would probably be making an excuse for why I can't join them anymore. Knowing that the rest of the group has my back and sees me as a part of the group is really comforting. And it's what allows for me to look at the situation and just sort of laugh. Weirdly enough, it helped me move past some of the insecurities I was having about being both the only girl and the youngest person in the group. I was worried they were going to assume I was inexperienced or immature, but I think it's safe to say they've accepted me as one of their own. Hopefully, I won't be back here with any stories from this particular group. Thanks for reading. Man, it's just refreshing to see a group that actually has each other's backs. You don't need to stand up and fist fight for your D&D group, but that also doesn't mean you need to sit back and watch as someone acts like a frickin' weirdo. Now, I do want to say, a character who blows a kiss to seduce some guards and distract them so they can get sneak attacked, or a damsel in distress character, those kind of characters can be fun. I played a damsel in distress in the 10th tomb, Vex from Critical Role seduced some guards in Legend of Ox Machina, those things are fine, but that's because I and Laura Bailey chose to play those characters. If somebody doesn't want to embody the archetype, that is their choice. If somebody does want to embody the archetype, that is also their choice. It's important to let people choose what kind of character they want to play. That's part of the beauty of D&D, and trying to force that kind of fantasy onto somebody just because you horny? Weird, man. Very weird. decided to do 4d6 and drop the lowest for my stats, and I somehow, in front of witnesses, got an 18, an 18, an 18, an 18, a 17, and a 14. And I, in my infinite brilliance and wisdom, made a human fighter, cause, uh, funny. His name was Keith. He had not spent any starting gold and had no equipment, and with 17 wisdom and 14 charisma as the dump stats, I decided he came from a seaside village where everyone has 18s in all their stats because they all had to deal with orc raids in the spring, dwarf raids in the fall, and two yearly kaiju attacks in the winter. Ah uh, yes, the Mary Sue village. What do they deal with in the summer? Alt-right YouTubers. Keith was exiled from this village for being unobservant and ugly, but the dice gods giveth and the dice gods taketh away. Keith, thanks to improved unarmed fighting, combat expertise, and power attack, was quickly able to loot some arms and armor off some orcs in their first engagement. However, once armed, the dice decided that Keith was too powerful and should never roll above 10 after bonuses. So long spear, sword, talking to orcs, yelling at orcs, sneaking past orcs, spotting orcs, everything whiffed. 
except a boot to the head. Seriously, it became a running gag that Keith only carried weapons or spoke to deceive people, drawing attention away from the deadly boot of Keith. A standard Keith run would typically go like this. Pre-combat, try to talk to or bypass the enemy and fail. Step one, I move into polearm reach. Step two, I attack with my spear. Spear portrayed as a sword. I don't know yeah, point, okay. okay. Step four, wait for enemy to move close past spear danger zone. And step five, attack of opportunity with my boot. Hits, deals enough damage to just like instantly kill somehow. The campaign wrapped after about five sessions, but the sheer ridiculousness of Keith just warped my brain. Now, whenever I roll max stats for a character, I have to make them a human fire with no gear. Why? To appease the dice gods and show humility, for I have been blessed. And now all I need is a boot to the head. Some call it a waste of good rolls. I call it penance. Come on, I gotta throw a glory story in here every now and then. And yeah, this one's a lot of fun. As a dungeon master, players, please try not to watch this, but as a dungeon master, sometimes I'll bend the health of enemies to buy into gags like this. If the boss has like two health left after the attack and it would be so funny if it actually killed them, I might consider truncating that two health. It's fine to do that as a GM. Your players will remember that for forever. Create lifelong memories about fun games. I completely understand if you don't want to do something like that, but hey, to me, it just might be worth it. This game has been going on for roughly five years. Most of that time, I was a spectator, not a player. The GM identifies himself as experienced. He's only run this campaign for this group of players, though. His definition of experience. His players were new when he started and only have experienced his game as a GM. I have been playing slash running for over 10 years with a range of systems. Blades in the Dark, Shadowrun, Marvel Multiverse, World of Darkness, Werewolf the Apocalypse, many more. To the point spectator, I noticed that there were a few problems. He focused more on his story than his players, meaning his story was more important. If the players didn't follow his vision, he didn't let things happen. Every fight was a video game boss fight, one you would find in WoW or Final Fantasy XIV. Oh god, I, I like that! I like having raid boss mechanics in my D&D games. Keeps the players on their toes so they're not just saying, oh, I hit the enemy over and over again. My players enjoy it. I mean, hold on. My player. Do you, of sound mind and body, swear that you enjoy my D&D boss fights? I do. Okay. He would also change the rules every other session. Help action, advantage, damage, etc. That's just the icing on a layer cake. In one session, he had a new player. Pretty much handed her a character sheet and book and told her to write up a level 15 character. She barely got any help. But I didn't interfere yet, not my game or my player. I waited and watched. I would think I was writing my own game at the time. The writer would not risk his game to the destruction of a terrible GM. No help would come from the OP on that day, nor any day since. <laughs> A few sessions went by, and I became close friends with the newest player. I observed a few confusing things, the GM's encounters, and I asked to sit down in the game and offer to help the new player. The GM and the new player were okay with it. I read over the player character sheet and noticed it was missing a few things. GM was allowing feats, but she didn't have any ability score improvements or feats, for example. It was clear that one, she didn't get any help, and two, the GM didn't go over it with her. I present options to help her get the most out of her character, utilizing the terrain and skill set. She was playing a Gloomstalker Ranger. During that session, they kept on shutting down her abilities and giving her disadvantage. He shut down other players through other means as well to create challenge. The Ranger he did the most harm to. <laughs> like, Rangers need any more hate. <laughs> I did ask him permission to help the ranger with her character sheet. By now, the ranger was level 17 and had no help with character advancement. Her, the ranger, had a change of work schedule and she asked the GM and me if I could run her character while she was absent. 
I didn't mind, and the GM was okay with it. I helped while she was there, and I played when she wasn't. 15 levels are a lot for new players. I got invited to a level 20 one-shot for my intro D&D 5e, and I refused that in not-so-polite words. Back to the ranger, so there I was, but as a player character now reading the table on the map. Imagine, a group of individuals not working together, I'm a big fan of tactics and been raised on TTRPG teamwork. At this table, in this group, there was just no helping each other out. It seemed like it was every man or woman for themselves. He also didn't let the Gloomstalker work on its strengths, shutting down sources where the rangers would have advantage. I lost my crap. I voiced my opinion on the Discord server and the players used for correspondence, trying to be cordial and not sound confrontational. I got chewed out and told, people should play how they want. People aren't required to help each other out. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> Look, that wasn't part of my point, but okay. Most of the players were non-confrontational, so me trying to be an advocate for them tends to upset the ones that liked the drama and confrontation. I attended a few more sessions to support my new ranger friend, but my stress and anxiety was just getting worse. Chronic illness with chronic pain probably wasn't helping either. In the end, I told the GM and ranger I couldn't be at the table the way the GM was. I liked him as a person, but I just didn't mess well with his DM style. The GM also tried a rules lawyer as a player at the games he's in. Like, he just can't turn off his GM brain. I am still friends with many of the players, especially with Ranger. She was efficient with her build, optimized enough to do her role. The last session I sat in wasn't great. She wasn't allowed to do anything with her character, but she and a few other players did advocate for themselves. Maybe something good did come out of me being verbal. I struggle with self-advocacy with my chronic illness anyway. Look, there's definitely an argument to be made that you shouldn't say anything if it's not your table, but if you're sitting in at a session and you're seeing people do stupid things, you should be allowed to say something. Now, you don't need to be listened to necessarily. However, that doesn't mean you should be forced to stay silent, especially since this guy was playing at the table eventually. Look, a good amount of the group weren't interested in what this writer had to say, and that's okay. Everyone plays D&D differently, and if you want to play a game where teamwork is apparently banned, fine. <laughs> but at the same time, it doesn't hurt to say something. As long as you weren't being confrontational, I see no problem with it. And hey, you might have inspired some of the other players to say something too. My best friend, for the purposes of this story we'll call him Paladin, I, have been friends for quite a while. I'm a long time D&D player and he was not. So he was inspired by my stories to play a regular game with me. I didn't know the first thing about online D&D, so I found my way to the D&D Discord and put up a post for the both of us as players. We had an offer within about two hours from this DM who wanted to play with us. He said he had a group prepared to go and lo and behold, he needed two more players. The first session was really fun. I played a fighter and there was another guy who played an artificer. There were three other players, but I can't really remember what they played. It wasn't important anyway, since two of those players dropped out and blocked the DM on Discord after the first game. <laughs> That's not concerning at all. <laughs> Pretty shortly after that, the other player, Akenku, left due to quote-unquote scheduling issues. Now we're down to three, so DM introduces two new players, Warlock and Druid. Warlock was playing a 12-year-old girl despite being a 30-year-old man. It was a little strange, and it made me a little uncomfortable, but I accepted it. I had a fighter reach out to Warlock to get to know them, since my fighter was our resident mascot character. But my roleplay attempts were met weirdly and mostly just shrugged off. The rest of the party also attempted to befriend Warlock, but theirs was not met the same way. In situations where the party had opportunities for good roleplay, my fighter like punched Artifice for second character. No damage rolls, just roleplay stuff. It was fun, and Artificer and I talked about it beforehand. But Warlock made it a point to stay out of the room while everyone talked and roleplayed. After every session, Warlock would then complain that we weren't doing enough to make them feel included. The capacity of this bitch. <laughs> <laughs> After several times of this happening, DM kicked Warlock from the group. Warlock then sent a message to Druid, whining and complaining about it. Nothing came of this, however, and we all just ignored Warlock's attempts to harass our group, including reporting the DM for transphobia in the Discord, which DM received a timeout for. Important side note, DM was not a great dude. <laughs> Thanks for the spoiler, man! But at the very least, he wasn't transphobic. About this time, Barbarian was added. Around the time of Warlock's removal, something else started happening. 
Druid, a woman, started hitting on Paladin, my best friend, a guy. She, not very subtly, tried to ask if Paladin and I were dating. And when I told her I was gay, she seemed to just take that as the go-ahead. She started making gross comments about Paladin, trying to tell him to break up with his actual girlfriend, and got rather snobby and presumptuous about the life of what to her was a complete stranger. It rubbed me the wrong way, but I tried to ignore it. If that's all she had done, maybe this game would still be running today. Pfft. Bro, she was trying to get him to fall in love with her based pretty much solely on her D&D &D character. He doesn't know her as a person. He just knows her character. And like, you know, to be fair, I think my characters are way cooler than I am. But I ain't trying to flirt with them, man. This game was never gonna last. For a part of the story, an all-powerful wizard had locked us away in a dungeon in another plane. We were being taken out and forced to play games for his entertainment. This went on for many sessions. During one of these games, all of the players were dropped in a hallway with Dark Souls-like traps. That's DM's words. I was playing fighter and recently multiclassed into Barb, so my health was bigger than anyone else's in the game. I took the lead down the hallway, opened the door, only after we thoroughly inspected it. One failed deck save later, the DM laughed maniacally as a giant pot of lava dropped from the ceiling and just one-shotted my character. Okay, to be fair though, did you expect the deadly lava to kill you slowly? All right. Perfect rolls, everything going. Oh god, wait, no, no! After all the time we'd spent being toyed with, just as felt like a blow to the gut, but I tried to brush it off. Druid actually stabilized my character, but Paladin started dumping all his healing spells on me anyway for two reasons. If I got hit by another trap while at one hit point, it would pretty much be an insta-kill with how this dungeon was going. But arguably, the most important reasoning was that my character was Paladin's 15-year-old son. DM out here killing children like it's arcane. <laughs> He saw his son get down and immediately started dumping healing spells, as that made perfect sense, both in character and out of character. But midway through this healing, DM read the annoyance on my face and said that if I got back to half hit points in a few rounds, I could mitigate the cosmetic damage to my character. Read, not turn into a pile of molten flesh. We did that, got me back, and carried on, but the druid, she was not having it. She got upset and yelled at Paladin's player to stop being so irresponsible. That was a waste and started making snide comments. We ignored her though and carried on. Later we encountered a giant fan sucking us down a tunnel to turn us into mincemeat. And both Druid and I failed our saving throws and would have been chopped up by the fan. Paladin was the one in reach to save us and the DM said he could only save one of them. Paladin and I above table are best friends and on table are father and son. So Paladin saved me, rest in peace other person. Druid survived and regrouped with the party but she seemed very upset with this. Session ended and she blew up the discord complaining about Paladin. When I tried to explain why Paladin had done what he did, she blew up at me and I suddenly became her number one target. She told me I complained every time I took damage, which I didn't, that I was too sentimental about my character, which, I mean, I was sentimental, am I not supposed to be? And that I'd made Paladin waste spells for purely cosmetic reasons. She complained to everyone who would listen, including the DM. DM got into a call with us both, claimed that neither of us were in the right, and told us to drop it, basically. I did, but she obviously did not. Next session, she barely spoke, and when she did, it was to be rude. At one point, she split off from the party, and when another roleplay event happened, Artificer's first character returned, my character was mad at him for disappearing, so he went to do the hug and smack cliche. She finally piped up to cast a full-on PvP spell attack on me in an attempt to restrain and choke my character, the 15-year-old child. She was using some homebrew variation of mage hand. In confusion, I rolled and succeeded her spell save DC by a long shot. It was a strength save. I'm a fighter barbarian. But then, Artificer called out that her character shouldn't even, like, be there. She didn't speak for the rest of the session after that. And as soon as DM said, I think we'll wrap it up here, she left the call. I believe after that she complained about me again to DM, 
who wasn't having it and removed her from the group. She then made a group chat with us to complain about the DM, but we all blocked her and left the chat. Two new players were introduced, Paladin number two and Sorcerer, and finally, finally, we're going to enjoy our game, which is why the story is over now. Yippee, woo. Damn it, I'm only halfway done. Uh... Nope. For whatever reason, the DM decided to make a DMPC that could compete with my character, since the way I'd min max my character, by the way, cleared with the DM before the game, it kind of made me invulnerable to all the damage, and he had to one up on me. Okay, hold on. Invulnerable? What did you do? What, what, what class combo does that? A fighter barbarian with the same combo and setup was introduced, but this character came with a deck of many things. The only thing I hate more than the false hydra. Side note, I already hate the deck of many things, but this experience has made me straight up ban it from the games that I play. Artificer took to the deck like a moth to a lamp. He pulled a ton of cards. One of the cards he pulled, which by the way, was just a hypothetical pull in the Discord between sessions. But anyway, it was a card that gave him the horde of the nearest dragon. The DM thought it'd be funny to make that dragon the all-powerful crystal great worm that was supposed to be like the campaign ending level of strong. We were in this raft city and the dragon shows up and starts killing people. We attempt to return the horde and the go- were, were you keeping the dragon's horde in like a bag? The DM refuses the horde in the bag and the artificer is swallowed and digested. The rest of the group was struggling to find a solution to escape this floating city in the middle of the ocean. So we sell on this. Both paladins will put everyone into bags of holding and we're to be pulled out every 10 minutes for air so we don't suffocate. Worst case scenario, our other DMPC could revive us. He had a cauldron of revivify with some bag that gave him infinite salt. DM this whole time kept rushing us by describing how much closer the dragon got to us with each second. And when we told him the plan, he was like, you're sure? All right. You all die because you put bags of holding into bags of holding? We were stunned. It was a stupid plan, sure, but there was almost nothing else we could have done. And with him rushing us, we didn't have time to realize, especially since half of us are new players. Also, you don't instantly die, right? It just creates a portal to another realm. Oh, yeah, exactly, it does. I mean, actually, that should be a good escape plan. By this point in time, every single one of us had been checked out. It was a total TPK except for Paladin number two who flew away to safety. DM Lair told him he'd have to change characters during the next part of the game. DM also apparently has no idea what to do. His world worked on a cycle, so things would happen again. He suggested just resuming at this point in the next cycle and making everything that happened some sort of bad dream. When we all unanimously agreed to the dream solution, he scrapped it and decided to do something else. He skipped all the way to the last chapter in the game, which killed our families, our loved ones, and any hope of getting my character's story arc, which was important because he was mute and his story would let him speak. We were basically reset to level one, lost all our gear, and were jettisoned into space. Session ended there. Nobody was happy with this solution, so I reached out and asked him if as a group we could like talk about it and what was going to happen moving forward lots of players had stuff that was important to them story-wise completely lost by the dm's decision i got no response next day artificer dms me frantically asking if he'd gotten kicked from the campaign he hadn't dm had nuked everything from the server to the roll 20 probably with the brontosaurus <sighs> this joke is dead it's been months no one's gonna get it anymore Hold on. Uh, yeah, no, I can't do it. Anyway, after nuking the Discord, he blocked all of us on Discord and refused to speak to us at all. Much later, I stumbled upon a post the DM had made in the Discord server where he asked other DMs if what he had done was right. He lied about everything in the post, blamed me for wasting healing spells for cosmetic reasons. I guess he agreed with Druid after all. He gave three reasons on how we TPK'd. It was kind of cathartic that most of the DMs called out his lies pretty quickly and determined he was at fault for what happened. 
He gotcha'd us and laughed when we were upset with the loss of the characters we worked hard on. But hey, story has a happy ending. Artificer, Barbarian, Sorcerer, and Paladin number two turned out to be great guys. Despite losing our DM, the whole lot of us stayed together, and I created an entire campaign in four days just so we wouldn't miss a scheduled D&D game. We added one new player since then, it's been about five months, and lots of us have been having fun in my new world. There's been no drama, thankfully. Everyone has matched fantastic together, despite the horror story that was our first campaign together. I truly couldn't ask for a better group of friends to share D&D with, and I hope that this group has years together, which it looks like it will. Don't jinx it. Oof, we got like a double horror story here, two-pronged, you know, we got the fem cell at the beginning, but we have just a god-awful DM at the end. The lady at the beginning clearly has zero class. I thought the weird pick-me energy she had with Paladin was bad, but my god, the way she was acting around the OP was terrible. It's funny because I feel like a lot of misogynists and incel types use pick-me's and femcells as an excuse to be hateful towards women, when really, I feel like those pick-me's would agree with the damn misogynists more than they would expect. I find a lot of pick-me's tend to have really hateful thoughts towards other women in their lives. In this case, this person being a friend of the paladin might put a target on her back. I have a feeling this DM's world is a bunch of problems the writer didn't even realize. Like, that cycle system sounds confusing as all hell. But on top of that, imposing strict time limits on the party is sometimes a good thing, but other times it can be downright frustrating. Joe Cat brought this up as a problem with Arcadum's DMing, and I'm seeing a similar thing here. Look, sometimes it's okay to put on pressure, but if it's too much, it just gets freaking annoying. Hey, that's a wrap. If you guys enjoyed, then you might enjoy this previous episode where we go over one of the most overpowered homebrew classes I have ever seen. Seriously, maybe want to quit DMing. It's linked in the cards. But before you go, please leave a like on this one and subscribe to Crispy's Tavern so you don't miss any of our content when it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, you can go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. He has a girlfriend. Tell let me know at the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can send them directly to us. There's an email down in the description down below. Send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, and that's like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Farewell. Farewell.